What do you know about using herbs? Whether it's for you, for your dog, for your cat. I have to be honest and say that I know enough to get myself in trouble <laughs> and not much more than that. It is absolutely fascinating to me and at the same time, a little scary. And in fact, we find out why in today's episode, why it is a little bit scary because there are so many wonderful non-toxic plants and herbs that we could be trying out all the time. We could be learning about them and finding out what they are energetically and what they can do for our body, for our health, for our dog and cat. And we don't. There, there are quite a few reasons for that. And today's guest is going to help demystify herbs, especially for our canine friends. I am so thrilled to welcome today's guest to you. We have just become fast friends and I am so in love with her. If you're not familiar with Ms. Rita Hogan, she is a clinical canine herbalist with over 20 years of experience. And she specializes in holistic canine herbalism. We're also going to learn what the difference is in herbalism and holistic herbalism in today's episode, as well as some ways that you can learn more and become more comfortable with you utilizing herbs for your dogs and maybe even for yourself. So we're going to be talking all about herbs today on this episode of the Pet Parenting Reset with Miss Rita Hogan. Here she is. <coughs> Have you tried training methods that just didn't work? Do you feel that your pet is not getting his or her nutritional needs met? Are illnesses and bad behavior your daily norm? You're going to want to join me on the Pet Parenting Reset, where you'll hear interesting and informative interviews and get solutions to all your pet problems. I'm your host, Jessica L. Fisher. Rita, thank you so much for joining me today. I have been looking forward to this for so much longer than you know because herbs, herbs confound me. So I need I need people like you in my life to, to help me with with herbs and how we use them because my like philosophy for everything is that nature provides. I just am not sure exactly how. So I need to look to people like you for how that all works out. So thank, first of all, thank you so much for being here. And I would love to start our talk. We're going to talk about so much today, but I would love to start off by like your journey. How did you get into herbs in the first place? And was that with people or animals? Have you ever worked with people? I'm very, very interested in this. Um. I, uh, I got into herbalism with, you know, the rooted in my lifestyle as a kid, you know, I worked in the garden with my father, my, my father had a, a gargantuan garden, like, you know, just like gargantuan. I mean, I don't know how long it was, but it was huge and it took, you know, an entire day to plow it. And, you know, it was just huge. And, uh, we worked together side by side and he used plants for our chickens, cows, and pigs and horses. And um, I didn't pay attention to what he did with our dogs at that time. Uh, I was so involved. I mean, the dogs were always just kind of by our side. And so, but uh, what's really cool is um, we had a dog named Susie that lived until she was 24 to 26. So it's, it's kind of, no one knows the exact age, but we know she was at least 24. And um, she was there before I was born. And then she was there after I went to college. And, um, uh, and I know that, you know, she didn't eat kibble. She was fed raw milk. I know that because he used to squirt it into her mouth from Molly, my, our cow, our milking cow, and just squirt it right. And, and the cats would line up and he'd squirt them. And, um, which was cute, but, uh, Molly, um, Molly, so I'm sorry, Susie. So raw milk, leftover meat, um, scraps from our table, and that's about it. And she was never spayed, and she, uh, she I don't think she was ever vaccinated. Um, so, but she just lived on our property. She didn't go anywhere, you know. And um, 
uh, she did have some puppies. Um, so she lived like a pretty normal dog life, you know, and I wish I, you know, myself right now wishes I would have paid more attention, but I didn't, I was little, I was, you know, I was just a little girl, but, um, our horses were the same. My horse was the same. We, you know, we didn't do a lot of things that you see now in the horse, horse world. And, um, so when I fast forward to, I, uh, you know, I studied Ayurveda in my, um, life at the University of Minnesota. I studied Eastern philosophy, Sanskrit, and different types of, um, uh, different type, types of Eastern religions. And then that didn't, it just didn't, I was a Buddhist for a while. I, it didn't sit with me. So it didn't resonate with me. Nothing wrong with it. It just didn't resonate with me and my, and where I'm from. So, um, I went back to Western herbalism when I was 30 and I'm 52 now. And so, um, uh, going on about, yeah, going on 22 years of practicing herbalism, started out making products and I, you know, it, it was very innate in me. And I, I moved to this property that had 36 acres and, you know, it was all woods and plants and it was just wonderful in, in Tennessee. And so I just decided one day I, I boarded dogs, kennel, kennel, did, did kennel free boarding. And I just noticed how sick the dogs were. And that people would hand me a, a bag. I say this all the time. I feel like a broken record, but like people would hand me a bag of kibble and some pharmaceuticals and just say, you know, I'll see you in a, in a week or I'll see you in two weeks. And, you know, the dogs were so sick, but people just didn't even, they didn't know. And I was there a long time ago too, about 25 years ago, I was in the same kind of boat. And, um, and I just decided to dedicate my life to dogs and herbs. And I, you know, I, someone asked me, you know, did you go to college for that? No, I made it up. Like, I was like, okay, I'm going to be an herbalist. And well, I wonder if there are any herbalists just for dogs, you know? And I said, well, that's what I'm going to be. And so I tried to figure out what to call it. Someone said, well, what are you? I'm, uh, I'm canine herbalist. I'm, I like the canine versus dog. You know, it sounded better. I'm that kind of type of person. Um, and I was like, I'm a canine herbalist, you know, this is what I'm going to do. And yes, I, I do work with people usually uh, dog owners. Um, you know, we, we, you know, balance out their dog and then we work with people, but people, people are harder than dogs because they get in their way. And I have found that, um, women in general, because women are the bulk of my clients. Um, because I find that they are definitely the dog caregivers for the most part, not saying men aren't involved at all. I'm just saying the, they, they uh, like, I would say 10, nine to nine women to one man. Right. Um, and I find women in general need a lot of poking and prodding to, for self-care because we're so busy taking care of everyone else and, and every problem in the world and solving problems and stuff like that. So it's hard sometimes to work with people because they, they, they definitely get in their way. They just, they will do anything for their dog, but they won't, they won't do those same things for themselves. So. Um, Humans, my fellow herbalists that do not do canine herbalism, uh, you know, my fe a fellow herbalist tribe know what I'm talking about because they work specifically with humans, you know, and we always talk about, you know, if we just, it's part therapist and part herbalist because you really have to get people to, to give themselves the same grace and ease that they want for their dogs and animals. Mm -hmm. There were so many things in there. I'd love to... <laughs> To, to touch on some more, first of all, your like the origin story is so fascinating to me, especially when we think about and things that we really don't even know, like as humans, we, like there are things we're just born with, like we're born being afraid of snakes, like that is just ingrained in us genetically kind of thing, unless I, don't know, I guess there are some some psychopaths out there that aren't afraid of snakes. But, <laughs> um, like there are just some things that I guess you know evolutionarily, like we just know and do, and it's like part of our DNA. And so when we think about when I think about when when you were telling me your story and how you grew up as a child, there are a handful uh, like maybe two or three other people that I've talked to on this podcast specifically, 
that I don't want to say they had similar mm-hmm. childhoods growing up, but they definitely, whatever it is that they're doing in life now started when they were a child and they were living this like really organic lifestyle as a child growing up. And those kinds of people like you seem to, how do I want to say this? Like you just, it's like there's something in you (laughs) that others of us may not quite have or um, have accessed. Like it's probably in there somewhere, but we haven't accessed it because we just didn't grow up that same way. That is just so fascinating to me. And I hope I explained that right. I I totally get what you mean. I mean, there's some people that are very, uh, I just think what's happening is people are growing up without nature. Um, You know, I grew up on a farm, so I spent my time outside in the woods where I didn't grow up in the city. You know, I didn't grow up, I I grew grew up in a rural area. You know, and but I do think that we all have a path to the green, however that looks up looks like. Um, I mean, evolutionary uh, kind of progression. We have not been on cement and in tall buildings for very long, right? Just a few generations, and um, so I think that it's in all of us. I I think the path is sometimes narrow for some and wider for others. But I think the longer you walk the path, the wider it gets, uh, no Mm -hmm. matter who you are. So um, some people have to get over their fear of nature because, you know, we have been conditioned to be afraid. We, you know, we, uh, I just read yesterday that we use over, okay, so this is a huge, we use over 1 billion pounds of pesticides every year now. Okay. And that's just saying that we're afraid of nature. We want all of our food perfect. And we, you know, and we're trying to combat nature and we're destroying it, but nature will be there when we're done. I mean, if you look at what happened during COVID um, and people stopped interacting with nature, like we do now, um, nature started coming back in unprecedented at an unprecedented rate. Um, and it will do it again. So, I mean, there's no way that we can, uh, we're not smarter than nature. There's absolutely no way. Be it, scientists has not, I mean, scientists don't even know how um, fish swim in a school so fast and move so fast as one. They can't figure that out. They can't figure out how they contact, what, you know, how they communicate with one another. They don't understand how birds do the same thing up in the sky. You see those huge, you know, swarms of birds and they all, they all turn at the same time. You know, like they don't understand. There's so much we, I, you know, I personally think in my own personal belief, I think we probably know less than 1% of the knowledge that's on this planet. Mm -hmm. And we think we all know about 90%, which, you know, is our egos, which uh, always gets us into trouble. Uh, Always. Mm -hmm. And I think that like, that's very hopeful for me too, that we just, there's so much we don't know that, that is out there. But so, okay. The, the topic you brought up with women specifically, like standing in our own ways of caring for ourselves, this, this idea of self care that triggered me too, because I, I probably spent the, at least the last 10 years, maybe a little bit longer, learning and learning and learning and learning and trying different things with my pets and getting them healthier, getting them on a healthier diet and being very, you know, I have my supplement graveyard, (laughs) trying everything and then cutting it all back to like next to nothing and doing all of the things. And that has led me into, and I think that's one of, one of the very important, (laughs) sorry, the very important things that people like you do is that when you, when you kind of wake up this part of somebody where they're like, oh my gosh, look at what I can do naturally with my animals. I think there's this kind of, like we, we start to realize that, oh, we can do this for ourselves too. Like we can start taking care of ourselves better. And 
that in turn also allows us to take care of others around us better. So it's this like beautiful, like symphony of things that start happening. And so I have personally been on this like self care journey for maybe the last year, year and a half and have started using some herbs for myself and seeing some improvements. Now I have no idea exactly what these herbs are. They come in a bottle. <laughs> and, and I took them to my muscle tester and she was like, oh my gosh, these are muscle testing. So fabulous for you. Please use them. So I'm using them. And to me, like I, 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 I know in my head, like logically there are so many wonderful things that herbs can be doing for my pets, but I have this like, like, I'm, I don't know why I'm scared. I'm like, I don't know. I don't know if I'm going to mess something up, if I'm going to make something worse. So uh, having somebody like you come on and talk a little bit, maybe try to demystify because they just herbs confound me. So can, is there, are there any tips for people like me who are like, I'm scared to get people like over this hump of being scared of using herbs with their pets? Um. Yeah. I mean, I think it's a, it's a paradigm shift. So, you know, I, I recently was subjected to normal television. Um, you know, I'm, I'm a streamer for sure. I don't like any type of commercial and I was recently subjected to commercials. And what I found interesting was they were all pharmaceutical commercials. And, you know, at the end, it tells you that, like there was one that makes your antidepressant work better right? When your antidepressant stops working, don't stop using it or, or wean yourself off. Just add this one. But at the end, the side effects were unreal, including death. Okay. So death or, you know, a uh, immune disorder, autoimmune disease, or, uh, you know, cancers were a lot of them. And pharmaceuticals save lives. They've saved my life. I'm not saying anything like that, but I find it very interesting how someone is okay using a pharmaceutical because their doctor told them, despite the long list of side effects that is in the pharmaceutical, but they are afraid to use a plant that's sitting outside their door. You know, I know if I walked out by my door right now, I'd see plantains staring at me all over the place or blackberry or, or you know, different types of plants. Um, but that is just conditioning. So we have been conditioned over the last hundred years to be afraid. Uh, and to think that every germ needs to be destroyed, even though we definitely need germs. Um, you know, everything needs to be managed. And we, as a people, cannot survive without pharmaceutical intervention. And that's one of the scariest parts about just living on this planet right now. Like, we literally can't, like, you will die unless you go see your doctor for your checkup or uh, get your pharmaceutical medicines. Um, I don't know the statistic on how many people are on some type of pharmaceutical, but it's extremely high. And I think it's over 65%. Um, so given that, um, you, you really like start out with non-toxic herbs. So, you know, one of like, it's winter for the Nor Northern hemisphere and we're going into, you know, deeper winter. And one of my favorite winter herbs for people and dogs is nettles, dried nettles, uh, because um, winter rules the kidney and the kidney really needs a lot of really great minerals to work the way it should. You know, if you're getting up to go to the bathroom in the middle of the night, uh, your kidneys need love. Um, you know, dogs, their kidneys all need love right now. The kidneys rule the bones. And so uh, this is also a big time of, of muscle tears and um, different type of musculoskeletal problems, arthritis, being stiff, you know, a lot of moaning and groaning going on right now, which is a, an emotion of the kidney. And uh, according to traditional Chinese medicine, I am not a, a TCBM or um, TCM herbalist, but um, I do use a lot of their diagnostics and I do believe uh, most of their, uh, you know, uh, diagnostic patterns. But um, nettles just helps revitalize the tissues. It helps my, my, uh, one of my mentors, Matthew Wood, um, 
who I worked with and just followed for since the beginning, um, he talks about how nettles uh, make things in the body work again. Him and um, this really great other herbalist, uh, uh, Jim McDonald. Um, and, you know, they just get things working again. Um, and that usually comes from kidney kidney energy. And they also have, you know, they also work on the liver and the lymphatic system and give your body minerals. And you want to use young nettles. And usually uh, most of the nettles are har harvested in spring and uh, then they're dried. And you can use it as a tincture and you can use it as a tea. You can make a tea with your dog. Like I was making dandelion root tea this morning um, for uh, my dog and I. And I, I did my first TikTok video this morning with dandelion root tea. And um, which, uh, yeah, I've, I've decided, I was talked into starting to do little tiny itsy bitsy videos on TikTok. I don't know how long, I don't know how that's going to go, but I'm going to give it a try. But um, yeah, uh, so, you know, you start with just one herb and, and see how you do with it. And usually you'll know within probably three to six weeks, six, eight weeks, if it is, it's going to improve your health. Um, and not all herbs work for all people. Um, another thing, you know, you say, well, it's, I'm, I'm mystified by them. One of the things is that plants speak a different language than pharmaceutical medicine. They have their own language and, and in Western herbalism, um, which is the predominant type of herbalism in like, uh, the United States, Canada, um, small parts of South America, not much. Um, but, uh, we share a lot of the same plant space and, and like, uh, Europe, like Ireland, England, um, different places like that, that we share the same climate. Um, it, it all plants work on a system of energetics, no matter where they are in the world. And their plant language is however you put it in, in your, kind of ethnic background or ethnicity, like warm, cool, dry, and damp. That's the qualities that they have. And some are, are stimulating, some are, um, you know, um, diffusive and, and they have other properties, but I always look at well, how warm they are, what they do to the body. Do they warm it up or do they cool it down? And do they add more moisture or are they drying? Many, 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 many plants are drying. So, um, you know, uh, nine times out of 10, it's drying. But in a different, like, it's on a spectrum. So some are very drying and some are slightly drying. So like nettles are slightly drying, um, but they're pretty neutral. And they're they're not too warm. They're not too cool. So they're a really nice herb to start out with, especially in the wintertime. So, and all plants That's have that those that energetic signature yeah that it, it's interesting to me and and i could be totally wrong about this because when i think of nettles my first thought is for allergy relief yeah which makes high me high think high. of spring and summer because i so i've been feeding my dog extra greens with her meals to add fiber to because i've been working on her gut microbiome and so i went with the green juju, just greens that are freeze dried because that they also have nettles in them, um, where the frozen one doesn't. So, and I was literally like just running out going, it's okay. It's winter anyway. Like I don't need to worry about allergy, <laughs> but that's interesting that, okay. So nettles does so many more things. Oh, it does so many more things. Yes, it does. And, you know, and then parsley is good for your dog during the winter time. Um, uh, also, you know, whatever you do for your dog, you always want to think of their nervous system, no matter what, um, you know, there's an emotional uh, and nervous system component to every single type of chronic disease and, you know, everyday life. Uh, a lot of people are stressed, are highly stressed, and then their dogs are highly stressed and it really affects the limbic system and, um, how your dog responds to stress and if they get stuck in fight or flight um, because you know when you're most people and I've been talking a lot about this this year most people um, don't realize they're in fight or flight and our cell phones put us in fight or flight constantly uh, mm -hmm. you know I'm always in trouble for turning off my ringer on my phone and um, 
people get angry with me about it, my family members. And, uh, but the, one of the reasons why I turn my phone off is I do not want to hear the bleeps and bips and you got a sale and this and that and the other. I tend to look at it a couple times a day versus looking at it constantly because you, I mean, they've done CT scans on the brain and it lights it up um, like cocaine and sugar. So we are in fight or flight constantly with all of our electronics. You know, when I see someone um, and this comes from love, everyone. I'm not saying you're a bad person, so breathe. But when I see someone that has a cell phone and an Apple watch and an aura ring, I just want to grab it all and throw it in the garbage because that person you can pretty much guarantee is completely stressed out and has what's called electromagnetic stress. And mm -hmm. the interesting thing about being stressed out is your dog can smell it. Your dog can smell the adrenaline. It can it can smell the noradrenaline. Um, it knows when your cortisol levels are high. And the issue with that is that it feels, it knows there's something wrong. And so dogs get really stressed out because of our stress. So when we take care of ourselves, we're actually really improving um, the lives of our dogs and all the other people that we interact with. Um, there, the HeartMath Institute is this really great research center that is putting some hard science on uh, what other people, like not other people, but what, what people in general have thought of as woo-woo. You know, um, they are proving that our, vib our heart vibration extends, you know, several feet from our bodies. And we share this vibration with everyone around, especially in our homes. Um, and our stress is their stress and their stress is our stress. And a lot of times by just dealing with that, you see a huge drop in anxiety in dogs. Um, and then, you know, exposing them to fresh air. And I love dogs that self-select plants, you know, especially non-toxic plants. Uh, you can really tell a dog's energetics by the plants that they self-select. Um, a lot of times, like you'll see them forging outside and, you'll, you know, you've got a dog that's constantly eating plantain and, and dandelion and, and different really cooling um, plants, uh, especially consistently, because energetics is about consistency. It's not about the like one off here, you know, I eat this a couple times a week. It's about eating or feeding something every single day. And a lot of times, you know, I've seen people on that give their dogs herbs like over a year. Um, and some herbs can be given for a really long time. And the best way to figure out is to take that dog off that herb and see if they do okay off of it. What we really want to find, to answer your question in a long way, um, to really, what we really want to find is the minimum dosage for maximum benefit. So nettles, parsley, you mentioned those as good, like, gateway, <laughs> I'm going to say gateway drug. That's what I want to say, but gateways into trying out herbs for your dogs. And I know you have various different courses available to people that we can talk about in, in just a little bit. But um, if someone were interested in just kind of seeing the, the idea of a dog self-selecting, I've seen I've seen like kits out there for cats to self-select different herbs and there are different kits for like, you know, calming and diff different things. Um, I don't know that I've seen them for dogs, so I, I, I would imagine that the herbs would do similar things for both dogs and cats. Is that Absolutely. And there's just so, there's so many wonderful herbs like milk thistle seed and chickweed. And like I said, plantain, uh, turmeric, um, uh, ginger, you know, they're, they're, and they're, these are all non-toxic herbs. They're, they, they don't have like skull cap, uh, even Chinese skull cap, um, chamomile, which is, really found in so many kitchens. And then there's our more warming, spicy herbs. Like a lot of the herbs that we have in like kind of incorporated into our lives that have just like kind of showed up, like this is what you do, right? 
many of them are warming like oregano and basil and um, thyme, uh, things like that. Those are all very warming spices because they, they have this wonderful smell to them. And a lot of things that smell, smell very strongly have a lot of volatile oil in them. And, um, but you know, you can, you could try those out in your kitchen and you can offer them to your dog, see if you like them, just make sure they're non-toxic herbs, you know, um, I definitely have seen the differences in certain breeds to be able to self-select herbs um, that are not full of volatile oils um, versus other breeds, you know, like mm -hmm. Huskies. Huskies, I think, um, are extremely good at self-selection, whereas a pug, um, not so good. I've seen them like go towards herbs that would be completely toxic to them. Um, I wouldn't let them get to them. I, I have, I have pugs and um, I wouldn't let them get to, but just to see what they would select. And, mm -hmm. um, and I'm not saying that that herb wouldn't help them, but it would also harm them. Um, but they are very, um, all, all dog breeds that I feel all dog breeds are very good at self-selecting like something like an essential oil um, for inhalation. i only believe in inhalation for the most part using essential oils, but, um, and through self-selection because they are so potent and strong. It's the strongest form of herbal medicine. I don't, I don't use a lot of it, but um, you know, they're very effective when they're well indicated for sure, but they can self-select them. And, and I've seen miracles happen with that. Um, so mm. I like to play around, you know, as long as something's non-toxic, I love to play around. Okay. Now is, t is turmeric warming? Yes. That seems like it would be warming to me. Okay. It is. Um, it is one, that's warm, one thing. But it's warm. It, okay. That is one thing that my dog always refuses. <laughs> I'll, every once in a while, I'm like, Let, let's try this golden paste again. Or, and she's just like, no, I don't want that at all. <laughs> yeah. Um, your dog may be a warm dog. Um, <laughs> turmeric is very warming, but not hot. Mm -hmm. So um, ginger is hot, uh, you know, and so um, like cayenne is hot. It's diffusive, but it's hot. Um, uh, so yes, I mean, you know, I'll, and that's a good, that's a good kind of like, I tell people, I, I talk about this in my book, you know, turmeric is everywhere. Everyone is on turmeric. But one of the things is, is that it can actually work the opposite for dogs that are too warm. Um, mm -hmm. you know, I recently had a client that was on a good, a very good mobility supplement as far, I do a lot of formulation. And so for companies and it, from a formulator perspective, very good, very good formula, but it was a very warm, hot formula. Okay. Which is very good for cool dogs because you want to get that circulation up. You want, you want to get that lymphatic flowing. You want to get up that energy. Okay. But in a, a warm dog, it's going to have the opposite effect. It's going to cause more lethargy. It's going to cause more stagnation. Um, it's going to cause more inflammation, even though it's an anti-inflammatory. So um, she stopped using the supplement. She had her dog on it for about six months. And her dog has so much energy now. And it's the only thing she changed. She, I, I, you know, we just said, you know, take your dog off that supplement and let's see what happens. And because they've been on it for so long, we just, we want to make sure that they don't need that supplement or could be wrong about their energetics. Um, and uh, sure enough, I mean, just night and day. So um, I think one of the things, one of the best things to do is learn about your dog's energetics and the energetics of plants. Um, you know, one of the best ways to do that is to look, if you're going to Google, don't, follow web md for plants um uh it has some okay information as far as some research that have been done on plants but usually they're standardized which is another conversation but uh you look up let's just say milk thistle monograph or milk thistle herbalist monograph and there are some really good herbalists out there writing some monographs i write monographs too um, we all kind of exchange information and then sometimes we discover new things and, you know, there are some new research and, and stuff like that or anecdotal or in the field clinical evidence that comes about um, that can be replicated. Uh, 
and they write monographs. They're just like a resume for a plant, but a really good one, holistic one, is going to include a, a plant's energetics. Um, mm -hmm. And that's like the difference between holistic herbalism and allopathic herbalism. Okay. That seems very important too, because like you were just saying, the formulation of a supplement that you're purchasing can look amazing, but if it's not an energetic match for your dog, you're like you said, you're going to get potentially the totally opposite effect of, of yes, what you're looking that, and, for. Yeah. And then remember it's consistency. Okay. Uh, a lot of people don't hear it when I say it, it's consistency. Um, but if you have, if you have a dog or a person, I have a great person story, but if you have a dog or a person that has severe chronic disease, you're going to see the difference much quicker. Like for instance, I had a client that is a, is a cold person, not even cool, cold, has mm -hmm. chronic disease, has a uh, MS and, um, was given a supplement by a, 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 a functional medicine doctor and the functional medicine doctor, good doctor, but is, is working allopathically, like not paying attention to plant language, gave him a supplement that. I know has worked very well for other people, but this supplement is cold. It is cold. It has gentian in it. It's a very cooling supplement. So he was on the supplement for three weeks and lost the use of his legs. He could no longer walk. It's because he he's already a cold person and you're adding all of this cold. It's not just like taking um, like a 30 second cold shower that also helps like bring you into parasympathetic activity um, and kind of activate your nervous system. It's day in and day out, three pills, you know, three servings a day of this supplement to help with you know, some type of parasite, you know, help with um, whatever they were trying to help him with, but not looking at him as an individual. And he had such, you know, MS is, is very serious chronic disease. Okay. And so you're going to see those, those effects so much more, um, because you don't have a lot of wiggle room, you know, and, and they, uh, the interesting thing about energetics and kind of like biomapping herbs onto people as individuals, the cancer, um, the cancer kind of climate is starting to, to, to kind of understand that where they're doing genetic testing between the patient and the plant to see if there's compatibility to keep people from using plants that are just not going to work. And basically they're mapping energetics. And mm -hmm. um, so when you're dealing with severe chronic disease, it's more important to, uh, to figure out the energetics of the plants and your dog. Um, when a dog is pretty healthy, if you're not doing something consistently day in and out and you're doing some nice rotations and rotating, rotating, rotating foods, veggies, you know, different types of things for the micro following a seasonal pattern, which I absolutely love. Um, you're not going to see that, but like blackberries aren't really supposed to be around in January. You know, I feed my dog blackberries every day, someone might say, or I feed them blueberries every day because they're so good for you. Well, you feed anything every day and you're going to get sensitivities. You're going to get a buildup um, and you have less a chance, less of a chance of that if it's energetic match. It's if, if it's an energetic match. Okay. It, well, and that kind of brings up two like kind of two two different people in my mind or two different and there's probably a whole lot more two different types of dogs like a dog who is pretty darn healthy you're just interested in you know the pet parent is just interested in optimizing their health and their quality of life and then you have these dogs that are sick so when we're talking about dogs that are sick based on what you just said, in my mind, it would make sense that you would want to work with a professional like you. <laughs> I know, I know you stay pretty booked up, but, but a professional to, to figure out 
which herbs would be better to start off with to try so that you're not doing a whole lot of harm with them, even if they are, you know, the non-toxic herbs that, that, that you're talking about. Whereas a pet parent who has a relatively healthy dog has a lot of wiggle room and they could, for instance, lay down a towel and some hopefully organic herbs they have in their kitchen and just kind of put pinches of them around and see what their dog gravitates to. Does yeah. am I kind of, does that make sense in the way I'm yeah, explaining absolutely. it? And, um, uh, I had a horse, uh, like a whole horse consultation this morning. Uh, I am not a horse surplus, but I have a horse and want to do the best by my horse. And my partner and I were uh, meeting with um, uh, animal uh, herbalist homeopath, and we were discussing which herbs to, one, I have to figure out my horse's energetics, but two, like just picking different seasonal herbs and putting a bucket down with those herbs and seeing which ones he wants, you know, um, and that's definitely one. And, you know, horses are vegans, so it's, they're, they're very predisposed to plant medicine. So it's very easy for them. We just don't want to put something down that they might eat that make them sick because cows and horses will eat stuff that they're not supposed to eat like cat's ear or, you know, different types of plants that just don't work out for them. But, um, uh, yeah, I mean, you can definitely do that. And I definitely love seasonal herbs and, um, you know, trying to just to figure out, but, but yeah, turmeric, you can put some turmeric, a little bit of turmeric down. You can put a little bit of, you can even put a little bit of oregano down, small amounts, um, an itsy bitsy pinch of nutmeg. Don't, uh, not, I'm sorry, clove. Don't give much clove. Hardly ever don't give more than a minuscule. What is it? Those, those little tiny, you ever see those little tiny teaspoons that are like a yeah. pinch of smidge and a something else. Yeah. yeah. So that. It's super tiny. Um, and uh, some parsley and some freeze dried nettles and some, maybe some hawthorn leaf or some dandelion root or some dandelion leaf or some marshmallow, um, different types of, of non toxic plants. The clove is a little on the toxic side, but you just want to, just a breath, <laughs> uh, or just don't include it at all if you're scared. But, um, and see what your see what your dog uh, wants, or you know, work with someone, or learn. You know, I love to recommend people learn like a plant or two a month. You know, and then years go by so quick, right? Don't they? And if you learn one to two plants per month, uh, and how it interacts with your dog, you know, taste it, smell it, uh, buy a tincture of it, or get make a tea out of it. Um, there's some really good resources out there. Mountain Rose Herbs has wonderful videos and resources. Um, there's lots of different types. I have I don't have a lot on my website. I wish I had more time to do tons of tutorials, uh, but right now I do not. But I'm it's getting there. Um, but you know, just learn about one one plant a month, and you have twelve plants that you are secure with, that you are confident with by the end of the year. And in two years, you have 24 plants. And I will tell you, most herbalists use about 12 plants regularly. They, you know, you get your jam. There's so many pathways to healing, right? There isn't just one. And there's certainly not just one plant. Um, there are some plants that do wonderful things, but they're just plants. And you can have, there's like, you know, like skullcap is a nervous system plant, but there's another 30 nervous system plants, you know, in different, like in TCM or in Western herbalism or South, I like call it South American herbalism. Um, you know, there's all these different plants. And so 12 to 24 plants is a huge array of different plants that you can keep switching up for your dog, especially if the, those types of plants actually work for your dog. So if you can get like a good five to 10 plants that you know your dog does well with. You can really up their nutrition, up their, like get rid of stagnation, make their lymphatics move. Um, I love calendula for dogs that are cool. And I love cleavers for dogs that are warm. Those, those are my two faves. Love them. Nice. So there's so much that you have already said, and I'm sure a million more things you could say. <laughs> 
And because of that, I know you have some courses that are available for pet parents. Can you, do you want to talk about those a little bit? Yeah, I have a few offerings. I'll just go through my offerings. So I have two websites because my course platform will doesn't sell anything. So I have my cons, uh, my consulting and and store, which is at canineherbalist.com. And then I have my uh, platform, which is uh, canineherbalism.com. And uh, on Canine Herbalism, I have my podcast, which is Dogs or Individuals. Uh, it's they're found wherever you listen to your podcast. Uh, and then I have that that's free. And then I have subscription com- community. So that's where I will answer any question that you have. We do live trainings every month. I do a live Q and a on the entire platform every month. And, um, you can basically, you know, have access to me. Um, and I will answer questions. I do. I answer every week all through the week. And then, and I also share some good content in there, but I do live trainings and then that's $10 a month. And then I have my monthly monographs, which is plants. So I do one plant every month and we cover it in depth. This month is parsley. Uh, speaking mm-hmm. of parsley. And um, this month is part, is this month's parsley? I think, yeah, this yeah. month is parsley. And uh, next month is echinacea, uh, uh, both plants. And then um, that is $12 a month. And you have full access to all the plants in in the library at that time. It's kind of, you, you can't really, it's a weird way to charge for it. So I just charge $12 a month and it's also a way to support my work. And um, then I have my canine energetics course. It teaches you how to um, find out your dog's energetics. It has some great monographs in it. It teaches you what herbs, uh, some introductory herbs for that particular energetic. It also teaches about how dry your dog can be or how damp your dog can be. A lot of dogs are damp these days. Um, And how to kind of solve that and understand your dog as an ecosystem. It's very important. And energetics is a great way to do that. So I have that course. And then I have my brand new course, which is a phytoembryonic therapy training. Now that course is for um, for guardians and dog owners, but also for uh, health professionals, um, trainers, rescue people, people who do rescue, vets, uh, vet techs, and um, different people, even doctors. Uh, I have a couple doctors in the course. Um, that is about using plant bud medicine. So plant stem cells uh, for cellular healing. And it's an entire system of medicine uh, that I that is very dear to my heart. And so um, that's training and that's a certificate course. So is the energetics course. Um, it's, a, it's a pretty big, you know, it's a big course. Um, it's a lot of monographs. There's over 68 of them. So oh, wow. of the different phytoembryonic plants, um, there are actually liquid remedies and you can find them here in the States. You can find them in Canada, Australia, and uh, th- all throughout Europe. So they're pretty ready- readily available. And there's about, I would say, I'm going to add about 10 more plants, but there's about 75 um, plant stem cells that that they use. Um, like in Romania, it's an entire uh, system of medicine because pharmaceutical medicine isn't big there. And um, it's recognized by the European Union as a full system of medicine. So I have that course. And um, do I have anything else? No, I think that's it. But, but my canine ener- my uh, canine herbalism holistic canine herbalism level one course is coming out on March eleventh. Oh, interesting! So, uh, a lot of people have been waiting for that, and that will be my kind of like flagship course for all my other courses, um, except for the phytoembryonics. Uh, it will be, I'll have a level two and then a level three, uh, which will be a uh, practitioner's course. Mm, interesting. Yeah, there's so, so much. And that's, I mean, the, the mon- I'm sorry, I'm going to say this wrong. Monographs is what you were? Yes. That's what they're called. That sounds so um, valuable. <laughs> to have access to just monographs they're not they're they're canine monographs and of course whatever you know if it's good for high blood 
pressure for a canine, it's good for humans too, but the dosage is different. And I go over dosage in every monograph. I include some recipes and how to make, if, you know, if it's appropriate, how to make a tea, how to make a decoction, how, you know, how to use the plant with your dog, uh, from tinctures, extracts, glycerates. Um, they're very in-depth. Um, and I even include some TCM use and, you know, the name and it's, it's pretty cool. I, I do a, eventually it'll be a book, but, um, right now it's just monographs. So, yeah, that's exciting. That's very exciting. I'm very interested. <laughs> um, okay. So I, I feel like you could probably speak on this for weeks and months on end I without stopping. <laughs> <laughs> it's my life. But, I love it. love it. I could keep going on it for hours and hours and hours and hours. Yeah. But I think you've given um pet parents specifically some good starting points. What do what are your thoughts on some of the um oh I'm trying to think of the best word wording for them, but uh, you know that there are a couple of companies who will kind of put various herbs together for different ailments in dogs. Formulas? So you, I'm sorry? Formulas? Yeah. Well, yeah. And there are, there, there are a couple of companies that are doing different formulas um, that some, some of them are available directly to pet parents. Some of them you have to get through like a veterinarian um, do you think, I mean, there's probably some benefit there, but you're not going to get in some dogs, you may not get where you're looking to go without taking a more individualized approach. That's kind of how it seems yeah, in my I mean, mind. You... Well, I do a lot of formulation and for companies like, like you're talking about, um, when you're formulating for the general public you know, you really want that formula to work, uh, like seven out of 10 dogs, you know, that's what your, your goal is. Um, uh, I hope to do some formulating for cool and warm dogs in the future. I'm actually going to have that in the works. However, um, formulators in general, you want to see like how cool or how warm that formula is, you know, and then you have a better chance, but just right off the bat, getting the formula, you want to, you know, give the formula. And I like to just take some notes, you know, what's, what's, how's my dog's skin? How's their eyes? How are things going with them? And then give it four to eight to 12 weeks of, of time, depending on what kind of thing you're trying to balance out, you know, uh, the more severe, the longer it's going to take, um, and see if, uh, let's just, let's just say like a seizure formula use something. So like a seizure formula, you'd probably want to give about three months to see if it's going to bring down the seizures. A lot of people don't have patients, you know, you, it's not a pharmaceutical, it's not a hammer, you know, so, you know, pharmaceuticals are hammers, you know, look at how quick Xanax works. Xanax works in about 20 minutes when you're having a panic attack, right? That's because it's a hammer. It opens up the GABA receptors with a hammer. It knocks the door down, you know, like we need GABA, but like, um, herbs don't do that. They can, you know, like I've, I've had homeopathy work really fast. I've had some works work. Some things work really fast. Rescue remedy works pretty fast. Um, but not as good as it does over a long period of time, giving it every single day, you know, um, but dried herbs work don't work as fast as a tincture at all. Um, and a lot of dogs that are taking dried herbs uh, have some assimilation issues. So it's no, you know, it's being processed as a food. And if you're not assimilating things very well, it's just going to take a lot longer to see an effect. Um, I like tinctures uh, because I don't use a lot of medicine. So I'm a drop doser. Uh, as a clinician, I'm, I, I do drop dosing. So unless it's, something that's major, right? If we have something major, we're not going to drop dose, but drop dosing, it helps stimulate healing um, instead of pushing, but sometimes you have to push. Um, so there's just, you know, it's just a huge, there's a huge flux in that. But um, I think that the biggest obstacle for using herbs is patience. 
and expectations. I think having expectations, what kind of expectations to have, uh, you know, like I'm giving a, a seminar um, for this uh, phytoembryonic um, company. I'm giving a seminar on uh, in January on the ultra sensitive dog. And, you know, there's a lot of ultra sensitive dogs out there, dogs that can't eat hardly any proteins. They react to everything. They're itching and scratching, things like that. But a lot of times they're itching and scratching and can't handle everything because pet owners are giving them the kitchen sink in desperation. And a lot of those things that they're getting are making things worse. So like for a sensitive dog, you really need to do one thing at a time and find their dose, which could be a minuscule pinch of something, even if they're as big as a lab, right? Because they're so sensitive or could be like one diluted drop of something. And then once their body is okay with that, you can start slowly adding, right? But a lot of times people get, we're so desperate for an alternative type of medicine from what we're getting at our veterinarian. And it's not the veterinarian's fault. It, it's just that they don't have the education you know, traditional medicine and Western allopathic medicine have not come together and they're, they, they're not respecting one another, which is one of my goals to change. And, um, and we need to, to, to give that respect so that we can take care of, and we can heal these animals. We want to heal. We don't want to just create symptoms that are suppressed because the issue is, is the more we suppress symptoms, the deeper the disease goes in the body. And so even like, you know, when you suppress, like when a dog gets a cut, you know, and you start pouring hydrogen peroxide, which slows the healing process, but like you start pouring it on, you're putting everything on, ointment, everything, you're suppressing symptoms. The body has its own way to deal with that. Now, if it's not healing, that's a different story. Then we take things to help the wound heal, but you want to give it a chance to heal because suppressing those symptoms does cause an ill effect in my opinion. So Mm -hmm. we don't want to suppress. We want to support. Mm. Lots of, lots and lots of good tips in there. Um, But I think probably the one, the, the one to end on is with the time, the time period, being patient, you know, your animal didn't get that way overnight. And if you really want to target the root cause of what's going on, that's not going to happen overnight either. And to be patient and let these things work and let the body use nature to, to support it in its healing process. And also, um, time, you know, if you're dealing with like a cancer dog, and you don't know the window of time that you have, right? Mm -hmm. Then you may need to use things in what's called a material dose, which is a much larger dose to push the body into submission, to buy yourself some time so that you can heal your dog. Um, And with cancer cancer dogs, which are more prevalent these days, for sure, um, you don't know, a lot of times you don't know that window of time. So, you know, and that's when to get some help uh, because, I'm just talking about everyday issues. I'm not talking about, you know, seizures and I I do not deal with diabetes Um, and, uh, you know, congested heart failure and cancer, things like that. Those need different types of support. And sometimes they need a bridge, like pharmaceutical medicine can provide a bridge so that you can get to the other side and work with natural plant medicine. I know that, you know, I'm not a huge fan of steroids, but I know they've saved my dog's life one or two times when I was feeding a really poor brand of kibble and it was causing pneumonia almost like every couple months they would get pneumonia. As soon as I stopped the kibble, the pneumonia went away. But at that time I needed the steroid. I think one of the biggest issues that we're dealing with in all veterinary medicine and human medicine is the dispensing of antibiotics. So, and I think that, and that goes with the, some of the biggest advice that I can give everyone, you know, we have to take a step back and breathe. You know, our dogs are not going to explode from a torn nail, right? They're not going to explode from a case of diarrhea. You know, a lot of those things can be dealt with at home to avoid 
antibiotics. You can always give the antibiotics if they get a really bad infection, but we don't want to give preventative antibiotics. And that's where plants can really help for sure. Mm. Yeah, that that's some really wonderful practical advice um, for people. And I, I highly encourage you, I'm definitely going to go check out your um, memberships and start learning more about plants because it just, it does fascinate me. And, and getting to talk to someone like you helps demystify it a little bit. And we all have it in us. We all have it in us. We just have forgotten, but we all have that knowledge in us. And you just have, like I said, you know, the path may be very narrow. The green path may be very narrow, but it widens as we keep walking. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I love, I love, 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 love essential oils. So it really, I really should learn more about how to use plants in other ways. <laughs> um, so Absolutely. I'm, I'm, I'm energized and ready to go and ready to learn. So I hope our listeners are as well. Thank you so much for being here, Rita. I really can't tell you how much I appreciate you, not just for coming on, but for everything you're doing and, and helping animals and um, putting this information out into the world because we do have to, we have to keep it going. That's one of the things that um, I know was a big topic of conversation among the veterinarians at AHVMA this year was that so many of the holistic or the more holistically minded veterinarians are getting older and they're getting to retirement age and they want to retire. And they're like, how do I pass my knowledge down? Because future generations need this. They need to know what I have done in practice Absolutely. and what I have learned. How do we do this? This needs to happen because they are, they want to retire. Like they deserve it. <laughs> Yes. And that's one of the reasons why I have created courses. And that's one of the reasons why, you know, I've got five books uh, in the make. Um, my, what, my first book is coming out. It was supposed to come out this year, but my publisher is behind. So it is coming out fall of next year. Uh, so, but yeah, I, I just want to get it in print and also have like a course for everything I print. But I also want to get it in print so that it doesn't go away. You know, mm -hmm. I, I, I really want to see um, veterinarians and herbalists and health coaches and different types of, of like natural medicine practitioners uh, come together and start respecting one another and learning from, an, from one another because we all can learn from one another. We just have to stop shutting the door in people's faces you know, and, and respect what other people are doing, meet people where they are instead of, you know, uh, polarizing ourselves because that's not going to help. Thank you so much for listening to today's episode. Make sure that you're following the show so you never miss an episode. And please take a moment to rate the show on your podcast app. I'd also love it if you'd share this podcast with your friends and family so that they can benefit from the information to help their pets live long, happy lives too. Don't forget to take advantage of this special discount as a listener today and get access to over 100 online videos and my online dog training, The Furry Family Coach. Just go to thefurryfamilycoach.com and use code PODCAST at checkout to get your first month for only $7. That's thefurryfamilycoach.com and use code PODCAST at checkout to get your first month for only $7. I can't wait to have you join and see you on the inside. Oh, oh, oh.